Welcome to uh, the uh, BGA's uh, webinar uh, with regard to COVID and open records. Um, we appreciate you joining us. We are uh, in the midst of a number of BGA members and other invited guests. We got a large response to this. So thank you very much for your interest in this topic. Um, we are meeting virtually at a time when uh, the Freedom of Information Act and the Od Open Meetings Act in Illinois both have seen a lot of attention and frankly uh, have been in some respects under attack. Um, my name is David Grising. I'm the president of the Better Government Association. Uh, with me as our panelists are Matt Topic, the BGA's outside general counsel, and uh, Marie Dillon, our policy director. And we have also Dan Beverly of the National Freedom of Information Coalition. Uh, they bring a lot of expertise. I'll introduce them more fully in just a moment. Um, the background we have is that the um, Almost from the time that COVID started, uh, freedom of information especially has been under attack. Uh, Mayor Lori Lightfoot of Chicago very briefly issued a statement stating that the city was not going to respond to any FOIA requests during COVID. After the BGA and others reached out and let her know that that was not acceptable, uh, she backed away from that position. But she did join an effort at the state level along with the Illinois Municipal League to shut down COIA responses during the course of the coronavirus pandemic. That effort ultimately was defeated in the legislature in part due to Marie's efforts uh, when, and it came after Governor J.B. Pritzker finally distanced himself from that effort. Meanwhile, uh, uh, in, in other news, the uh, Chicago City Council uh, during the height of the George Floyd protests held uh, some virtual Zoom meetings that were not initially disclosed to the public. We're not, we got no prior notice of them. Uh, th these were in violation of the uh, Open Meetings Act and the BGA, thanks to Matt Topic's efforts, uh, has sued the city uh, with regard to its violation of the Open Meetings Act. And uh, the city has assured us that any future meetings, informal or formal, any that, that qualify for uh, Open Meetings Act, uh, which requires advance notice, public, the public to have access to the meeting, the public to be able to speak, et cetera, um, that the city will no longer do these so-called informational meetings. In an issue that's unrelated to FOIA, but is worth mentioning and very important, uh, we, were, we were an amicus uh, uh, petitioner to a court proceeding with regard to the police uh, uh, the Chicago City Police and the uh, efforts on behalf of the uh, Fraternal Order Police, the police union, to have disciplinary records that were older than five years old destroyed. The FOP actually sought and, and, and obtained the, the right to do this in its private contract with the city of Chicago. And we joined a lawsuit, as did the city, to say that this was not appropriate under uh, FOIA and, um, and got a uh, favorable ruling by the Illinois Supreme Court so that these records will be retained. So it's been a time of significant action uh, on the part of, uh, in an issue that's really core to what the Better Government Association does. And I, I just wanna give you an idea of the expertise that we have on today's panel. Um, I wanna introduce first my colleague, Marie Dillon. Uh, Marie is the Director of Policy, as I said, at, at the BGA. Uh, she, in that role, she advocates for transparency, accountability, and efficiency at all levels of Illinois government. She came to us from the Chicago Tribune, where, where she was Deputy Editorial Page Editor, and she's got about three decades in journalism in places in Arizona, Ohio, and Florida before she came to the Tribune in 1999. She's been a Pulitzer finalist a couple of different times as one some local uh, uh, edit editorial awards, and she's a member of the Hall of Fame at her alma mater, the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism at Arizona State University. So thank you, Marie, for joining us. Thank uh, you. The topic is our, um, the BJ's outside general counsel. He is a partner at the Lovey and Lovey Law Firm, uh, where he is the head of their freedom of information practice. Matt is known across the state as the leading advocate for freedom of information. 
He secured the release of the Laquan McDonald video. Uh, he secured on behalf of the BGA the release of Rahm Emanuel's so-called private emails that were conducted on his cell phone. Uh, he's obtained records nationwide for the Mueller investigation, secured uh, the exoneration of an innocent man through a records request. Uh, he frequently represented journalists across the state uh, on gaining access to court records, quashing subpoenas for sources, fighting on constitutional gag orders. He's a graduate of the Chicago Kent College of Law and the University of Illinois. Uh, and then our, our third panelist is Dan Beverly, who is the executive, executive director of the National Freedom of Information Coalition, a national organization that the BGA is now just joining into. Uh, the, the FOIA Coalition uh, works to expand programs that support and sustain a national network of state coalitions. Dan focuses on challenges created by the convergence of information technology with governance, journalism, and public participation. He has spent time in government. He was for 13 years in the city of Louisville government. He has also worked at a public policy think tank at a civic tech solutions provider, and he once owned his own public relations firm. Dan uh, went to college at the University of Louisville and has a master's in public administration from the University of Kentucky. So thank you. Welcome to all our panelists. Um, so you, let's, let's get started with the questions. Um, uh, there have been efforts in the state legislature and by the city of Chicago to suspend FOIA during COVID. The argument essentially is that government officials are too busy fighting COVID to carve out time for FOIA requests. I'll just throw this to the panel. Do they have a point when they make this claim? I'll take that. Great. <laughs> I mean, I understand their point that it's a challenging time to have to do all of these things. and. Um, you know, we have a lot of people working from home, even in government, we don't have access to all the records, but I think it says something about their priorities, that they feel that FOIA is one of the things that they can dispense with, and in fact was one of the first things they felt they could dispense with. Um, if you look at the things that happened during a public health emergency, such as the little village smokestack demolition, or all the money that's changing hands, or if you look at the emergency powers that are being claimed by executives without the normal checks and balances, you can see why transparency is more important at a time like this. Matt, do you have thoughts about that, uh, given your experience? Yeah, I mean, I would echo all that, and I would just say that um, if you want to have a good COVID response, then you can't let the government do it in secret. I mean, FOIA is premised on the ability that the way we get better government is by holding the government accountable and that's by knowing what the right if they're allowed to act in secret I guarantee you they will not do as good of a job than if they know that we're all watching what they're doing they need to be you know they need to be on top of things they need to be accountable uh and i, I was really troubled to hear that they wanted to just say well, it's not going to process any foia requests because there were plenty of provisions available to work through this on a case-by-case -case basis we counseled clients like, look, be reasonable. It is true they have other things going on and it is harder to respond to requests because of the logistics associated with working remotely. Um, so, you know, be fair, be be reasonable, but it doesn't mean, you know, you just should have total government secrecy. If anything, we need more transparency in a pandemic, not less. And Dan, I'd be curious, you've got the national perspective on this. Um, I would imagine this sort of uh, issue has come up uh, Illinois probably is not unique in this respect. Tell us a little bit about what this has looked like nationally. Yeah, I would say take uh, Matt and Marie's comments and just multiply it by 51 <laughs> and, uh, and you have a pretty good idea. You know, we remember when this happened, you know, the, the, all this kind of came down right when Sunshine Week, the annual Sunshine Week to recognize transparency and open government was happening. And my question is, you know, just along the lines of what Marie said, it happened so fast that it was like, are you at least going to give this a try? You know, are we at least going to be able to try to engage whether it's, you know, I know we're going to talk about the meetings as well, but, but from the meetings and from information, um, make an effort to do this, just to roll this thing back and say that, uh, that we can't provide, you know, records uh, to, to the public and to the journalists is just um, amazing because a lot of this stuff, you know, I can understand, like Marie said, you had a lot of remote workers going on. Um, if this was old documents in a file cabinet in the basement of a, of a public building that had been shut down, that's one thing. But a lot of the information that was being requested 
was for current information, you know, information, health information, information about procurements, financial information, communiques between public officials that are easily obtainable these days. So what did they know that they would have to retrench from that, um, that, that now we're learning about in terms of having the capabilities or not having the capabilities, which many of them do have, to be able to respond to those records requests. And so that's been a really challenging thing. And, and as we know, um, on, on seeing this happening across the country in just about every jurisdiction that we've had going on, you know, as much as we talk about replicating best practices, we've certainly seen replicating worst practices when it comes to public records, uh, access to public information during this time. Interesting, it's a bit of a race to the bottom, it sounds like. Um, I, I'd like to uh, go to some specific cases. Marie, this, I mentioned at the top, this uh, effort in the Illinois legislature to suspend FOIA during the, during the coronavirus uh, pandemic. Uh, you got involved in in uh, putting an end to that. And of course, the governor's uh, statement seemed to have been a perhaps a turning point. You were inside uh, on all of this, uh, active on all of this. Tell us a little bit about how your role, uh, the role of the BJ, and, and then how this played out in terms of the politics of it. Okay, I'll, I'll try to keep it succinct. Um, <laughs> as you know, the General Assembly had an abbreviated session this year because of COVID. Um, they needed to pass a budget. They needed to pass a couple of bills in order to keep the um, the government running, but they not much else. So it was supposed to be three days long. Um, so um, late, late, late on day two of what was supposed to be three days, um, I got a call from our contract lobbyist, Scott Marquardt, because an amendment had been inserted into one of these omnibus bills. And um, what it would have done is um, what we were just talking about, suspend the Freedom of Information Act um, during the emergency order. And in fact, it would have made it retroactive so that all the people who were not following the law all along um, would get a pass for doing that. So, um, you know, I called Matt and we got each other fired up. <laughs> um, and uh, we started, started having to act really fast because, um, you know, it, in Springfield, where they were meeting, there, you couldn't go lobby them in person, you couldn't testify in person, everything was being done um, as an emergency. So I, I wrote written testimony and filed it, but I didn't have any real reason to believe that um, it was going to be seen. Um, so Scott got it into the hands of some key lawmakers, and I emailed it to some, and Matt and I were both... Um, calling the governor's office and emailing a lot of people. And um, the next day, it got worse instead of better. Um, the time period during which FOIA would have been suspended got even longer. So we doubled down. Um, and by this time, the journalists had gotten wind of it and they were starting especially to grouse about it on Twitter. And then the public was kind of uh, getting involved in it too. So um, I think lawmakers were kind of getting the message. Some of them might not have even known what was in the bill because there's so much in so many of those bills. Uh, and then one reporter um, accused the governor's office of being behind this request because um, I think they had a FOIA pending with the executive branch. And that's when the governor's office finally sent out an announcement that said, uh, no, we did not ask for any changes in FOIA. And in fact, we don't like this change and we would like for them to take it out. Uh, long story short, several hours later, they did take it out and it did pass. Um, I can't tell you what worked really, a combination of those things or any single thing, but I'm really grateful that the governor's office did finally step in. I'm really grateful that lawmakers did the right thing eventually. Yeah, it's nice nice to see that, that kind of effort pay off. Uh, before we have more questions, I'd just like to, to say to all of our guests, uh, Ernest sent out a note saying that the chat room is open for uh, your questions. Uh, a number of you all have sent questions in beforehand, so we have those at the ready. Um, we will um, set aside time toward the end for questions from the audience, and, and if one is relevant to what we're talking about, I might try to salt them in uh, here and there uh, to, to uh, the course of this discussion. So um, let's go from the state to the local level. And, and Matt, um, I guess this is a little bit of both. There was an argument uh, in court with regard to um, open records with regard to uh, mayoral communications. So what's at stake in that case? Uh, I think the arguments were last week or two weeks ago now, and what's at stake there? And, and when do you think we'll have some sort of disposition? 
Well, we've all seen um, over recent years this increasing phenomenon of uh, public officials using non-governmental email accounts to conduct uh, government business. Uh, obviously, we think of Hillary Clinton. There were issues in the Bush administration uh, with people using RNC email addresses in an effort to evade um, federal open records laws. And we've just seen it proliferate um, all around the country and in Chicago and Illinois have not been an exception. So uh, we've handled like a great number of cases, especially around this question of whether, um, as we would frame the issue, whether public officials can evade open records laws using private email accounts. Um, and that's been litigated around the country. Uh, and by last count, I have not seen a single state where, uh, where courts have said, yes, that's fine. You can evade FOIA by using a private email account. Um, they have pretty universally or really universally from what I've seen, have all said, no, that it's the, if it relates to public business and you sent it or received it pursuant to your job duties, then it's a public record, the same as if it was on a government email account, because otherwise we all know where this would end. You could just use private emails for all the stuff that you didn't want people to use. And we've, it's gotten worse now with things like self-deleting emails, with encrypted text messages. I mean, there, there will never be an end to efforts by um, at least some government officials to find ways to conduct business in secret. And so uh, the particular case we had involving, uh, it, uh, involving private emails, it came after we previously had, as you mentioned earlier, David, we successfully sued Rahm Emanuel's administration over his use of private emails and the city eventually capitulated and gave and turned over those emails to the extent they related to public business and they showed a lot of pretty interesting things. But then, you know, we thought, okay, this issue has been resolved at least to the city. And then we had another case where um, it, it, shortly after the, the Flint, Michigan lead in the drinking water scandal uh, came out, the, there, there had been efforts uh, by some reporters to try to figure out whether the city of Chicago had been testing the drinking water in CPS schools. And uh, it, it was a, a Rahm Emanuel's work the press special uh, in which they just slow played their request until they could announce their shiny new lead in the drinking water testing program at CPS school. And then quietly announced shortly after that, that they hadn't been, they had no records to Bruce because they had not been actually testing the drinking water. Uh, so BGA made a request for all their discussions about this, all their, their emails about, you know, discussing what were they going to tell the public about this, right? And this is a key theme in FOIA is that, you know, we're entitled to know not only what government officials want to say publicly, but we're, we're often and generally allowed to know what they said privately. And sometimes those things don't match up. And that's one of the very reasons we have a statute like this. Um, so included within that case, uh, was a side issue on whether they needed to conduct a search for private emails. And the city took the position that they're not public records, even though the mayor capitulated and turned his over, they, you know, just said, well, we're going to fight it. We're going to fight it anyway. Judge agreed with us that those are subject to FOIA, as many other trial court judges in Illinois have, but there had not yet been an appellate court decision on, on the specific issue. There was some other, there was another decision. It was in our, it was favorable, but it was a little bit different kind of a context. And the, the trial judge had ordered that they have an obligation to ask these people whether they have any private emails. So the city tries to make this into, oh, this is an invasion of privacy and the, the every government official is going to have their Gmail account ransacked by a FOIA officer and no one has ever suggested that. What we're saying is that if uh, someone makes a request for email, you have to at least ask the relevant people, do you have any emails on any other account that we don't have access to? And if they say no, then typically under FOIA case law, anytime the government says we searched and didn't find anything, that usually is the end of the inquiry unless you have some objective indicia that that isn't true. And then you can fight and you can maybe take a deposition and do that kind of thing. So really it was a pretty simple case about taking a few minutes to just ask some people, did you, do you have any emails about lead and drinking water on your private email accounts or text messages? And the city refused to and decided for reasons I don't understand that a case about poisoned water being uh, consumed by children was the case in which you would try to make the point that you can do all these things in secret. I mean, I never understood the logic of that. So as the case went, as the appeal went on, they eventually capitulated and agreed, yes, these are public records, but then they tried to get Weasley and impose like a 
a, 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 a needlessly difficult test on what qualifies as public business, which was not even an issue in this case, because there could be no question in that case that it was public business. It doesn't get more. Right. Than that, and what they're really trying to argue is like, well, unless we have some evidence that these people used a private email account, they shouldn't even have to ask anybody. And you know, how are we supposed to know that? I mean, we knew that for some of these people because they're they're it had come out in Rob Manuel's private emails that he was talking on the, with the private emails of some of these other people. So there was some indicia, but you know, it would be a very difficult rule to say that right. you only get private email if you already know that it exists. So that's what's at issue. So let, let me, let me uh, ask a related question because something a really good question has come over the chat, um, which is um, related similar to, to the issues that, at, that Matt is talking about, which is kind of hiding things from the public at, in an active way. And this is something on which Dan might have some perspective about during COVID, are we seeing more claims that attorney client privilege or attorney work product is an exclusion uh, for open records requests? In other words, our government officials as say the tobacco lobby, the tobacco industry did famously routing all of his commu internal communications through its lawyers in order to uh, prevent them from being found through disclose through uh, discovery. Is there any sign that games like that are being played nationally as governments try to figure out how to avoid responding to FOIAs right now? Yeah, so David, we have heard that from some of our coalitions out there. Uh, what, what we're hearing more is the claims of unduly burdensome and cumbersome. Uh, being able to claim those for reasons of not responding to public records requests. And, and like I said, it's we, a state neighboring Illinois. Uh, our coalition had requested a financial record for one month spending from one agency, uh, which the response came back that that was unduly burdensome uh, to provide that information to them. And of course, you know, it's one thing to say can't get to the record, but we've also had jurisdictions out there where the agencies have literally refused to accept public records. And uh, that's something that we just cannot understand. It's reprehensible, you know, like I said, and Marie had mentioned, it, it's, it's understandable that there might be delays in getting this, but to be able to literally flatly refuse a public records request from a journalist or an individual, uh, it just goes beyond, um, you know, uh, transparency. It's not even transparency at all. So in other words, are you saying that without any justification whatsoever, they're just saying, sorry, we're, we're you know, the, the yeah, shop's we're, we're not, or yeah, something? it's like we're closed. You know, we're not accepting public records at this time. And they're, and they're being able to say that with some feeling that, you know, they have uh, some justification, you know, from the top that they can make those claims. Wow. Well, so, man, I, no, go, I ahead, wanna, go ahead, David. Well, go ahead, Dan. No, I was just going to say, and, and, and the, the other concern that we have, and we've talked about this with some of the groups, is, is that individuals and journalists are really being careful in terms of the fights that they want to pick because we know that there are some concerns about sympathetic courts out there that would side with some of these public agencies. And, and understandably, in some cases, that may be the case. But we're trying not to, you know, we, we've had this bar set back a lot on open government. We've, we, a lot of hard fought battles for public records and public meetings have been lowered. And we want to be able to come out of this thing with not a new low normal, but to get back where we want to get. So I think people are being very careful in terms of what they're challenging out there. Right, and Marie, let me turn a question to you that's somewhat related. As a journalist, um, you know, you, you spent you know, all of your career, uh, you know, both as, a, as an editor and a reporter and an editorial writer. As a journalist, is there a point at which, and this kind of came in over the chat, uh, or, um, is there a point at which journalists should feel careful or even feel guilty about the fact that they might be distracting these government uh, employees from the importance of fighting COVID. Is, is this a legitimate concern? Um, I don't think you should feel guilty for doing your job. Uh, I don't think you should apologize. I think you should prioritize as both Dan and um, Matt have sort of suggested. This isn't the time uh, to ask for five years worth of expense reports for the entire city council, for example. You're not going to get those on schedule and you shouldn't get them on schedule. But um, the things that you need today, you should ask for today and you should insist on getting them and be willing to negotiate. 
Right, and, and, and related to all this is open meetings. And we've seen this very interesting case in which the city council uh, held some highly publicized regular city council meetings via Zoom and the mayor held court and, and we all were allowed to, we were given advance notice. We all were able to tune in and see what happened. And then of course, we found out because one of the participants released an audio tape of one of the meetings, we found out that the city council had had its own private uh, meetings with the mayor of the city of Chicago in which they had virtually uh, full attendance as, as far as I understand. Um, Matt, we went right at it and sued the city over this violation of the Open, of Open Meetings Act. Um, tell us a little bit about what the legal issues are and, and what is the current status of that lawsuit? Sure, uh, so the case is kind of just getting underway. Um, the city has said they're gonna stop doing this, so there was no urgency to like get an injunction to stop them from doing any more of this, but we think there are um, perhaps more recordings of some of the that haven't yet been released uh, that we think the public is entitled to under the Open Meetings Act. Um, and I think just getting a judge to clearly say that this is not allowed so that the city can't do it again is, is, uh, is really important. So uh, the Open Meetings Act in Illinois says that anytime a majority of a quorum of a public body is uh, meeting to discuss public business, that that is a, that is a quote, meeting, and then you have to comply with the, the openness requirement, meaning it has to be open and convenient to the public to attend. Uh, you have to give notice, you have to keep minutes. Um, you know, there's rules that apply to how those meetings are conducted and you have to allow for public comment. And this is the same city council that until a different suit I had done about two or three years ago, uh, historically had never allowed public comment in just flagrant violation of the plain text of the statute. Uh, and it took a lawsuit to, to get to the point where people can now pub even comment in a city council meeting completely so the city has a history i mean they're bad on foia they have a bad open meetings act history of just creatively interpreting these provisions and so what they did here was said well we weren't uh, deliberating to take a vote and so therefore it's not a meeting well i mean there's a lot of reasons that doesn't work for one it's not what the statute says for number two it's a majority of a quorum meeting not a quorum so you can't take a vote majority of a quorum you have to have a quorum in order to vote. The majority of a quorum is important because that is sort of the smallest unit that potentially, if it voted as a block, could vote a particular way. And so clearly the General Assembly is saying, if that group of people is gonna talk about public business, they have to do it publicly. Um, they can't have you know secret backdoor meetings where you, know, you could, where the bare minimum number of people voting as a block could get work done. So this, to me, I, I, I mean, I could be wrong. I strongly suspect the city never even really thought about this and that they just did it. And they are now scrambling to find a way to cover it up or not or cover over it. Instead of just saying, you know what, it was unique circumstances. We get it. We understand, it, you know, we should not have done it that way. We won't do it that way in the future. We thought it made sense, but you know, city government, they don't do that. I mean, they're not going to own up to the mistake. So they are drawing the distinction between what they are calling an informational meeting and a, a, a business meeting, I guess. They're not using a different term. Uh, is there anything in the law that would allow for that exclusion as you read the law? No, that's just a distinction that's completely made up. It, there is no uh -huh. informational versus something else. It's right. a majority of a quorum gathered together to discuss public business. And okay. there was a discussion. It was, right. now know it was a somewhat animated discussion with a lot of profanity involved. Um, and I mean, I, I, I can't see a court dicing discuss in a way that require. I mean, it's, it's, they all got together to talk about public business. Even if right. one was talking and the ref, rest were listening, I mean, that's a, that's a meeting under the statute. Right, so Marie, I'm, I'm curious to ask you this as, as a matter of policy. The, the implicit argument the city is making there is, hey, this was at the height of the George Floyd rioting. Aldermen needed to know what the mayor and the city were going to do about this. They couldn't go through the hassle, not that the city is saying this, but it's implied. They couldn't go through the hassle of public notice, et cetera, et cetera. They just needed to get together and talk while all this was happening in, in front of their very eyes. Uh, shouldn't Isn't that actually good? Isn't that a good form of responsive government that they're moving so quickly in order to get to respond? Shouldn't that be allowed as a matter of public policy that, that they can be that responsive? 
Well, I would say I don't have any problem with them having these conversations that if, and I understand why they felt they needed to have them. My problem is that they're not allowed to have them in private. Um, the law says if you're discussing public business in any way, then that's a public meeting. Um, you can go into executive session for um, limited reasons, but you have to take a vote in a public meeting to go into executive session and they didn't do that. They did all this kind of under the table. Um, you know, and the mayor says, well, okay, we've stopped doing them um, because somebody leaked the tapes and we can't speak frankly anymore. And, and you know, people don't feel like they can um, share, you know, privately, which they have no business doing. Um, and yeah, it's like Matt said, they were very emotional conversations. In addition to the profanity, I understand that there was some crying. Um, I'm sympathetic to public servants right now because I know their job is very, very difficult. But when you have all the aldermen on the phone with the mayor, it's not group therapy, it's a city council meeting and the public has a right to be there. Right. Um, I'm using so, a, a group therapy line in a brief three, that's all. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that is pretty good. That is pretty good. So there's a question on the, on the chat about, um, you know, what can an individual, individual do, uh, you know, when they hear about something like a violation of OMA like this, obviously the BGA is there and one of our roles is to file a lawsuit, et cetera. Um, Dan, I'm curious, you, you see these, these sorts of things nationwide. What, what is the role of the individual as it comes to enforcement of FOIA and, and OMA uh, laws? Yes, um, and they do have a role to play and they can play a, a very active role in this. I mean, we've heard so many stories on, on public meetings, we could talk forever. Uh, some of the challenges that we've been hearing on public meetings and, and also recognizing that a number of these government bodies have done a heck of a job to try to engage their, their constituents out there and bring them into this. I mean, we're seeing two things happening. One is the shortcomings of procedures, as you all are, you know, obviously citing there that are, that are in, intentional, and then a shortcoming of the technologies that are being used that, that don't do the job of replicating that process. Uh, even though they're out there, they're not being utilized correctly. But from a citizen's perspective, we have a couple of lawsuits that have come in to, we have a fund available to help with uh, legal fees around filing an open government lawsuit. And that can be for journalists or it can be for individuals or organizations. And so, and, and two of them right now have to do with the legal public meetings that were held. They were brought by citizens that we're helping out on. But any citizen that sees this or hears about this, my recommendation would be to contact their state open government coalition who's keeping an eye on this thing, just like BGA is doing in, in Illinois and doing a wonderful job there as well. I mean, we're really impressed with what you guys, uh, how proactive you are in these areas. Um, but every state has a group that can work with them and whether it's, it's a reporters group, a, you know, a press association or their open government association that they can, we have a map on our website at nfoic.org that they can look at, but contact them, ask them to work with you on this. And a number of these have come to us through the coalition where a citizen contacted their open government coalition. And, uh, and so, yeah, they do have a role to play and, uh, and can definitely have an impact to make sure transparency continues. Yeah, it's great to hear about that fund. That's really interesting. Uh, let, let's, uh, let's continue the thread here about public safety because obviously the point of that, those illegal meetings, at least one of them, was to deal with the public safety issues that were happening. Public safety is a big issue in the city of Chicago these days. And I made reference at the top of this, this call with regard to Uh, the, the, law, the lawsuit uh, for uh, the preservation, as it turns out, of police disciplinary records. Matt, what was at stake in this case that went to the Illinois Supreme Court? Uh, and um, was this a rare instance in which the city of Chicago was on the side of uh, preserving open records? Uh, so, yeah, the city was on the right side of this case. Um, and, and this specific issue, they, they've really been on the right side of it um, for a while. So. Uh, the kind of record at issue is what's called a complaint register file. So if uh, someone makes a complaint against a Chicago police officer for excessive force, for example, uh, that generates a complaint register file. And then there's an investigation that's supposed to occur. There's been a long history of problems with those investigations taking too long and being too deferential to officers and having a lot of, a lot of problems that many people believe um, are at the root cause of a lot of the problems we see in policing today. So um, 
there had been some questions about the extent to which those were public records, um, but there was an appellate court decision about five or six years ago that held very squarely, these are public records. Um, doesn't matter whether it was sustained or not. It, if, it, if it is a complaint or investigation of a complaint, it's a public record. And it's bit, bits and pieces of information might be exempt, but overall it's a public record that's subject to disclosure. So um, the, then the next thing that really happened is that the Fraternal Order of Police started getting very aggressive arguing that under their collective bargaining agreement, those records are supposed to be destroyed when they're more than four years old. And this, now that's subject to any legal obligation that the city might have to retain them. And so the city had never destroyed those records. So they still exist going far back in time. Um, and courts had held that if they existed and someone made a FOIA request for them, then the FOIA request has to be answered even if they were supposed to have been destroyed. Uh, on a, yet another track of this that that suit led into is the FOP initiated an arbitration against the city for not destroying those records and the arbitrator found for FOP and ordered that the parties confer and then the city challenged it and really won all the way from the trial court to the appellate court to the Supreme Court and what the what all those courts and especially the Supreme Court of Illinois held was that there is a public policy in Illinois in favor of preservation of records and the wholesale destruction of records that is contemplated under the collective bargaining agreement violates that public policy. And so as a result, that's not enforceable. And so uh, that has saved these records from a bonfire uh, that otherwise might have occurred. I tend to think the city was probably never going to destroy them uh, because the city was concerned that those might be relevant to a, a broader like pattern and practice suit against the city for failure to discipline or something like that. And so those records get requested in litigation all the time. And so the idea that they could just be destroyed would probably run into a lot of issues. And I, I think that's, I mean, maybe the city just really believed in transparency, but they previously had fought the release of these records. So I think a lot of it was just sort of protecting themselves against the possibility that a court might find that they illegally destroy records. So in any event, the records are saved um, and it's, it's good precedent more broadly for the idea that, you know, the public policy and transparency overcomes collective bargaining agreements. Right. So um, we've talked a lot about the importance of FOIA, especially as regards to holding government accountable. And a lot of this FOIA work is done by journalists. Uh, you know, as Dan points out, individuals uh, do, do submit FOIAs and, and the, the BGA uh, over the years has done a lot of training of individuals uh, who might be looking at a, a power plant uh, that's spitting coal dust into the air or uh, uh, an industrial site that's, that's leaching uh, mercury into the nearby waterways, et cetera. Um, Journalists clearly benefit from FOIA. Marie, as the direct, as the head of our policy unit, which works for uh, you know voting, voting act, you know supporting voting in the state, works on behalf of uh, a fair electoral map, for example, uh, has other issues, uh, ethics reform more broadly that you've been doing some work on. How does the BJ's broader policy effort benefit from open records? Well, um, I think historically the BGA's first priority has been FOIA, um, and I think it's always going to be the case. I think that transparency is sort of the foundation of everything we do. Uh, we're a government watchdog group, and you know, to put it very simply, I don't know how we can hold our government accountable if we can't watch what they're doing. So that's, um, you know, as I said, the most important thing, because if we don't have um, public records, open meetings, then we really can't do the watchdog thing. Right. And, and Dan, um, you, and we're, we're running uh, short on time here. We got about five minutes left of our scheduled time. Uh, the, the FOIA coalition is, is just coming to Illinois uh, through the BJ. What do you hope to accomplish? You know, why are you coming here? What, and what are you hoping to accomplish by, uh, by having a presence in the state of Illinois? Yeah, you know, this is an organization that uh, just celebrated 30 years last year. It was formed through a, a handful of press associations. And what we've learned over the years are the different state coalitions have worked very close together to be able to share information and find out what's going on in other jurisdictions. Sometimes it's after the fact, uh, but sometimes it's ahead of time to be able to share ideas, especially when legislature's coming into session to find out what bills are going on around certain topics, whether it's, you know, body cameras is a great example of, of finding out what 
other states were doing. So it's a great way to share knowledge and then also to, to, to get together when there is a challenge in a jurisdiction uh, to be able to come up with some ideas of being able to address some of those challenges out there, whether they be legislative reforms or whether they be policy reforms. It, it's a good network to have and, uh, and, it, and it's good to know what's going on in the other states as well. And that's been a great resource for not only the national group, but for all the members as well. And so, you know, we're excited about having BGA, very impressed with what's going on there from what you all have accomplished there. And uh, we think you're all going to be a great asset to the organization and to the members. And hopefully you'll be able to pull uh, some resources from us and from the other members as well as you guys go about doing your jobs, because you got a little bit of work there going on in Illinois. Absolutely. So I, I'd like to uh, sort of get wrapping with, with a good question that came in. Um, in a state as large and diverse as Illinois, and I'm going to put this to each one of you, in a state as large and diverse as Illinois, how do you mobilize civic organizations, media outlets, and citizens about the critical importance of government transparency? What do you do? What can we do? What, what can any, any of us do uh, to, to get people more aware and active on fighting for accountability in government? since you were just talking about it. Yeah, take that I'd, I'd be happy to. Thank you. Um, I think the, the importance is, is creating some, some partnerships out there into, into the, the state and into the organizations. Uh, many of these organizations, almost any organization at some time or another needs access to public information. And many of these groups are, are more ad hoc on their efforts and what they do. And a group like BGA or some of the state coalitions that do this on a day in and day out basis, they have the expertise. They know their state open government laws. They know their public officials and being able to work closer with those organizations that they can rely on BGA and then also you all be able to connect to those groups as well. Many of the groups have national affiliates. That's one of the things that I do from our perspective. Any of these national organizations that have state chapters, we're trying to get them to work closer with our state coalitions there uh, within the state. So I think networking, um, education, the, you know, painting a picture of why Freedom of information is critical these days. I mean, in a digital society, it's all about information and public institutions are no different. And it's important that the public has an opportunity to understand what their public institutions are doing and participate in those processes as well. You know, the, the electronic meetings, you know, hopefully this is not gonna be an experiment that goes away when we get back to in-person meetings because we've seen the benefit of having these electronic public meetings to increase engagement. Um, and I think we need to continue to have that relationship with our, with our public institutions and not an us versus them, but an us and us, you know, kind of relationship. Right. So Matt, let me, let me uh, put a finer point on the question for you, because as we've said, you, you've done a lot of work on behalf of journalists at the BJ and across the state. Uh, what about individuals? You've done watchdog trainings for individuals, giving them the tools of FOIA. How often do you, do you have individuals coming to you saying, hey, I've, I've filed a FOIA, I can't get a response. I mean, are residents of the state actively exercising their open records rights? Uh, yeah, most definitely. Uh, we get plenty of clients who are just sort of your concerned citizen type. Some might call them gadflies. Um, you know, it sort of runs the gamut. I mean, there's there's people that are very, very engaged in their local government as they as they should be, um, and have realized that you know it, little things, even like uh, getting the expense reports and credit card bills from a you know from a downstate library board, like who's nobody's watching that. Nobody's looking at how it, it, under the hood how is money getting spent when you get outside of the major metropolitan areas, there's just, it, there's not a lot of investigative journalism, unfortunately, that's going on. The local papers are very stretched thin and, um, you know, don't always do a lot of that kind of journalism work. And so I have seen a lot more just average people doing this. That we, we, the, you know, there's a huge debate about who's a journalist versus who's a blogger and, you know, new journalism and old journalism. And, you know, I don't want to get into the middle of all that because I have clients on all different parts of that. But I would say I've seen local people do really good work using their instincts to FOIA their way into some really interesting stuff that can have a really big impact in their local communities. And Marie, let me turn the kind of the civic organizations part of this to you. Um, how effective are civic organizations in banding together and fighting for more accountable government? And, and what, what needs to be done to enhance their effectiveness? Well, um, I work with a number of coalitions and I would say, of course, that there's strength in numbers. Um, 
and the, we have had some very good successes and some not so successful things. I think that um, one of the best things you can do um, is to let the public know what you have done. Um, I think that the public tends to look at FOIA as sort of a media against government thing and not to really understand um, that it benefits them and that we, what we do is on their behalf. And so whether you regard it as, um, I like to say, making some noise about what you've done, tooting your own horn, whatever. But when you go to bat on behalf of the public, you need to let them know that that's what you're doing and celebrate your successes and um, fight to the death if you have to. Right. Well, well with that, I, I think that's a great way to, to wrap it up. I, I, I would just want to thank our panelists for their really great comments and contributions here. I'd like to thank everybody who zoomed in. Uh, many of you, most of you, I think, are BGA members. Thank you very much for your support. Our, our slogan is, we demand better. And uh, with us, you are helping to uh, do this work. I'd invite anybody on this call who is not a member to please join. Our membership uh, dues are $100 a year. Um, it's a good way to kind of get connected to the BGA and the work we're doing in that when Marie then goes to uh, elected officials and talks about our work, to be able to say that she re re represents hundreds of members across the state enhances our ability to get things done. We're a nonprofit organization and we rely on contributions both from members and from others who just support our work. Uh, this is the important work we do. The timing is, has never been more important. Uh, just seeing how invasive government is becoming in our daily lives and holding government accountable through FOIA, through Open Meetings Act, through other efforts, uh, the efforts of our investigative team and other investigative journalists across the state, as well as citizens, as Matt is saying. Uh, citizens these days, residents of the state, are really the last best hope because so many journalistic organizations are so atrophied these days. So uh, I hope that this uh, you know, brought home to you some of the ways in which FOIA affects all of us and the work that the BJ and others are doing to hold government accountable insist on the right we have to a transparent government and ultimately get better government uh, across our state. So thank you very much. On behalf of the BGA and our panelists, I want to thank you for coming and we'll see you next time.